I'm Nick Schiffer, this is the Design Build Repeat Show, and on today's episode, we're gonna answer a couple of the framing questions you guys have asked on our Instagram page. We've got a lot of work done since we've last updated this project. I'm actually standing in what is going to be the living room, great room, the heart of the home where the family is going to spend all of their time. Uh, you can see that we have massive windows behind us. We're going to be installing Marvin Clad Ultimates here, and this is going to be able to overlook what will eventually be our driveway and kind of our parking court, and also some landscape here as well as the neighbor's home, uh, which has beautiful landscape as well. This room is awesome. Totally open concept to our dining room, that which is situated behind you guys. I really, really enjoy the fact that we maximize our windows. Uh, we're working with Mary McKee Architects. Uh, she was actually the architect on A Street Reno. And speaking of A Street Reno, if we walk over here, you're actually stepping right into our dining area. So we are bringing the living room into the dining space, and we'll, we'll get to the kitchen in a minute, but. Right here we're actually building, if you guys remember the A Street Reno, we built this massive 19 foot island that had this floating oak table at the very end of it situated on a piece of vertical half inch steel. Even though this home is a little bit more transitional style, they love that concept so much that we brought it to this project. Uh, and it's, it's, it's important to note that underneath here, we've actually doubled up all of our eye joists, floor joists. Uh, to combat any bounce that we might deal with with extra weight, 12 inches on center, three quarter inch Advantech, glued and screwed, our typical method, but we're, we're dealing with those doubled up eye joists uh, specifically to disperse that weight. A detail that the structural engineer, you know, basically detailed out for us to make sure that we were hitting, you know, our necessary standards for that. Jumping into the kitchen, I'm gonna start right here. This is actually our range wall. So our range will be situated with two windows, uh, shedding light on both sides of it, no upper cabinetry. And then along this wall with all the large windows, we're gonna have a ton of cabinetry here that situates all the way down to that wall. All of this is done with engineered lumber. We didn't build the entire addition this way, but these are our cabinetry walls. Anything we can do now in the rough stages to make sure that the wall is flat, plumb, and true, we wanna make sure we take advantage of it. Uh, these studs, they're about you know, two to three times the cost of a traditional uh, SPF or um, you know, possibly a, a dug fir stud, but they're giving us that true flat and plumb wall that we really need to make sure that our millwork goes in with the utmost precision. So we're gonna jump outside and we're gonna take a look at what we're using for sheathing here. You guys have had a lot of questions on what we've used. One thing you're gonna notice that's a little bit different from our new construction build down at Lake Drive and this renovation um, here in Newton is our sheathing material. Now, we're using a Zip R sheathing on our Lake Drive, um, and we're actually using another Huber product. This is Advantech half inch sheathing. On the roof, we're still using the Zip product. That way we can get a weather tight seal. It's a 5 8 product. The wall is a half inch panel, and the reason that we're using the Advantech verse using, say, a Zip is because we're gonna be stripping the siding on the existing home, exposing the existing sheathing. We could go back and replace all of that sheathing, but really no reason for us to do that. And we need to be able to install an air vapor barrier on top of the existing sheathing. So to keep things consistent, we decided to install Henry Blueskin over the entire home that we will be exposing. Uh, and what we're doing here is, now that we're using an Advantech, we would be applying that Henry Blue Skin over this as well. Rather than having dissimilar products on different parts of the home, everything is consistent. Uh, furthermore, we'll be using their Butyl, their Butyl Flash as well as some of their Liquid Flash products to install the windows, uh, really giving us a holistic approach as to flashing this home uh, and preparing it for our siding our rafter detail. So traditionally, we are plum cutting that. So you know, basically our fascia would be plum and your gutter would fasten right to that plum cut rafter tail. Here, we're actually doing a square cut. And what that means is if my roof rafter comes down at a 12 pitch, we're coming 90 degrees off of the top of the roof rafter for our fascia. So our fascia actually looks like it's on an angle, um, but it's actually a square cut to the rafter. Um, everyone asks the question, well, how are you gonna hang a gutter? We're gonna be doing half round gutters on this project with a bracket that actually holds that gutter off of the fascia rather than being fastened to it. So I just wanted to shed a little light while we had the opportunity uh, up here to take a look at it. Hopefully that answers the questions that you guys had asked on Instagram. Excited to see how this detail kind of plays out. So we're gonna head down to ground level uh, to where the new foundation is. 
and talk a little bit about why this foundation hasn't been backfilled yet. And I also have a special guest that we're going to chat a little bit about his approach. What's up, Matt? Hey, good to see you. You too, Thanks man. Thanks for having me. So, Matt, you live in Indiana. You flew out because I lost the bet. Yep. We went to the Pats game last night, but we're, we're, we're walking a couple job sites, and you're over here kind of looking and wondering, number one, why are we three floors up and not backfilled? Yep. And number two, what's going on with our drainage? Yeah. So before I'm gonna before I ask you, basically where we're at is we started this construction before we had a proper design for drainage. We also have a lot of grade change issues. You're gonna see that garage right now looks like it's subterranean, which is bizarre, especially if you walk here for the first time. We're working now with a landscape designer that is putting together a civil plan for all this drainage and controlling the water. We have a lot of water issues. The soil is not that great for drainage. So we're gonna restructure the entire yard, rework the driveway, get everything down, install a proper drainage system, and we've left the foundation exposed so we can do that, so we can assess things. For me, it's normal. We're installing a perimeter drain on the outside. We'll collect that water. We'll get it to a discharge base, whether it's to open air or we put a, a well on the ground. But you guys do something different in Indiana. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that we do, we focus on a perimeter drain on the exterior that ties in under the footings as well to a perimeter drain on the inside which is put in before the floor is poured, laid, sorry, before the concrete is laid. Placed. Whatever. Placed. Yeah. Uh, so we, and then that ties into a pump on the interior of the home, which is then pumped back outside to the surface drain. So I've seen the double drainage system. I've seen it where you put it in the inside with a sump. You also do it on the outside kind of, here's where we're controlling the water. Here's the, uh-oh, we didn't control the water. Yeah. But you're saying that you're tying them together. What do you mean by that? So I believe it's like every 10 or 15 feet that the two tiles inside and outside will come through the footing and be connected with the same tile too so all that water can connect through and get into the interior pump. So you're you're actively bringing exterior water inside your home yeah. to a pump to then discharge it. Yeah, and that slam. so you're trying to dis you're basically collecting that water and, and mechanically discharging it as far away as possible. Yeah, and I thought that was interesting that the two different approaches and the two different and maybe that's two different regions of how things have been done, but that's yeah, traditional I mean, practice in Indiana that it's brought in and then put back out. Right, which is interesting because for us, the, the we try to do everything we can to prevent water from ever entering, yeah. whether it's you know purpose purposely or accidentally. So you know we've taken steps here where we've actually done water stopping underneath our concrete wall as well as a capillary break to prevent any water mo moisture coming up. You know the, the entire vapor barrier on the inside, but we didn't do any perimeter uh, inside perimeter drain because we have full intention of having a drainage plane on this foundation, you know, total, uh, total subterranean to a drainage on the outside. So in our thought processes, we never want water and we never will have water entering beyond that point. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's very interesting. I think I'll, I'll take the information back to our foundation contractors and press them a little bit of why that, if it's a regional thing, that what makes the difference and why we do that. And you guys do full basements, correct? Yeah, and we full finish basements with that same model. Right. So. so, and no matter what, you're, you're using a sump pump. Yep. Now, where does that sump pump discharge to? Typically into the, like the storm sewers somewhere outside, so it'll come out on the surface and be exposed. So if it ever freezes, you yep. have a point there you can open it up and drain it off. Uh, but typically, that's tied into the stormwater system, depending on how that. The and that's municipal. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So for us, we're very, you know, very rarely do they want us collecting groundwater and discharging it into uh, the sewer or the stormwater. It's it has to be totally independent from the municipality. Yeah, we have some we have some urban issues with the older parts of Indianapolis that the storm sewers and the sewers are tied together, and they're going through and trying to separate the two of them. But they're not all areas are separated, so there are areas where it's pumped into the sewage system still. That's interesting. I know I've been on a handful of projects where it is tied in, but it's one of those hush-hush things. Yep. And it's usually an existing condition and we have to you know, explain, hey, there is no situation. Especially in Boston, we're dealing with these old brownstones and we're not, we can't, we can't excavate them. It's, you know, it's kind of, hey, this is what it was and this is what it's been for, for 50 years. Yep. We, we're not touching it. Uh, that's interesting to hear that approach. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited to see this kind of unfold and share it with you and kind of show you how we handle it. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, I think for me and for us, I think we're gonna stick to that, hey, I don't want water ever in my house. Yeah. Um, but I know that, I mean, stuff happens, so it, it'd be interesting to have that conversation and see wh where the, the pros and cons are, you know, for both of them. Yeah, I truly appreciate our time together. It's been a lot of fun. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming out.
Guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Design Build Repeat here at our NSB Newton project with Mary McKee. Make sure you guys subscribe to this channel, follow us on Instagram. The hashtag for this project is NSB Newton. We're always looking for feedback and here to answer your questions.